The Hate You Give, Chapter 18. On Sunday, my parents take me and my brothers on a trip. It seems like a normal visit to Uncle Carlos's house until we pass his neighborhood. A little over five minutes later, a brick sign surrounded by colorful shrubs welcomes us to Brook Falls. Single-story brick houses line freshly paved streets. Black kids, white kids, and everything in between play on the sidewalks and in yards. Open garage doors show all of the junk inside, and bikes and scooters lay abandoned in yards. Nobody's worried about their stuff getting stolen in the middle of the day. It reminds me of Uncle Carlos's neighborhood, yet it's different. For one, there's no gate around it, so they're not keeping anyone out, but obviously people feel safe. The houses are smaller, more homey looking, and straight up, there are more people who look like us compared to Uncle Carlos's neighborhood. Daddy pulls into the driveway of a brown brick house at the end of a cul-de-sac. Bushes and small trees decorate the yard, and a cobblestone walkway leads up to the front door. Come on, y'all, Daddy says. We hop out, stretching and yawning. Those 45-minute drives aren't a joke. A chubby black man waves at us from the driveway next door. We wave back and follow my parents up the walkway. Through the glass of the front door, the house appears empty. Whose house is this? Seven asks. Daddy unlocks the door. Hopefully ours. When we go inside, we're standing in the living room. There's a strong stench of paint and polished hardwood floors. Two halls, one on each side, lead away from the living room. The kitchen is right off from the living room with white cabinets, granite countertops, and stainless steel appliances. We wanted you guys to see it, Mama says. Look around. I can't lie. I'm afraid to move. This is our house? Like I said, we hope so, Daddy replies. We're waiting for the mortgage to be approved. Can we afford it? Seven asks. Mama raises an eyebrow. Yes, we can. But like down payments and stuff? Seven, I hiss. He's always in somebody's business. We got everything taken care of, Daddy says. We'll rent the house and the garden out, so that's going to help with the monthly payments. Plus, he looks at Mama with this sly grin that's kind of adorable, I gotta admit. I got the nurse manager job at Markham, she says, smiling. I start in two weeks. For real, I say, and Seven goes, whoa, while Sakani shouts, Mama's rich. Boy, ain't nobody rich, Daddy says. Calm down. But this helps, says Mama, a lot. Daddy, you're okay with us living out here with the fake people, Sakani asks. Where do you get that from, Sakani, Mama says. Well, that's what he always says, that people out here are fake and that Garden Heights is real. Yeah, he does say that, says Seven. I nod, all the time. Mama folds her arms. Care to explain, Maverick? I don't say it that much. Yeah, you do, the rest of us say. All right, I say it a lot. I may not have been 100% right on all of this, Mama coughs, but there's a ha hidden in it. Daddy glares at her, but I realize being real ain't got anything to do with where you live. The realest thing I can do is protect my family, and that means leaving Garden Heights. What else, Mama questions, like he's being grilled in front of the class, and that living in the suburbs, suburbs don't make you any less black than living in the hood. Thank you, she says with a satisfied smile. Now are y'all going to look around or what, Daddy asks. Seven hesitates to move, and since he's hesitant, Sakani is too. But I shoot. I want first dibs on a room. Where are the bedrooms? Mama points to a hall on the left. I guess Seven and Sakani realize why I asked. The three of us exchange looks. We rush for the hall. Sakani gets there first, and it's not my best moment, but I sling his scrawny butt back. Mommy, she threw me, he whines. I beat Seven to the first room. It's bigger than my current room, but not as big as I want. Seven reaches the second one, looks around, and I guess he doesn't like it. That leaves the third room as the biggest one, and it's at the end of the hallway. Seven and I race for it, and it's like Harry Potter versus Cedric Diggory trying to get to the Goblet of Fire. I grab Seven's shirt, stretching it until I have a good enough grip to pull him back and get ahead of him. I beat him to the room and open the door, and it's smaller than the first. I call Dibs, Sakani shouts. He shimmies in the doorway of the first room, the biggest of the three. Seven and I rock, paper, scissor it for the second biggest room. Seven always goes with rock or paper, so I easily win. Daddy leaves to get lunch, and Mama shows us us the rest of the house. My brothers and I have to share a bathroom again. Sakani's finally learned aim etiquette and the art of flushing, so it's fine, I guess. The master suite is on the other hallway. 
There's a laundry room, an unfinished basement, and a two-car garage. Mama says we'll get a basketball hoop on wheels. We can keep it in the garage, roll it in front of the house, and play in the cul-de-sac sometimes. A wooden fence surrounds the backyard, and there's plenty of space for Daddy's garden and bricks. Bricks can come out here, right? I ask. Of course, we aren't going to leave them. Daddy brings burgers and fries, and we eat on the kitchen floor. It's super quiet out here. Dogs bark sometimes, but wall rattling music and gunshots, not happening. So we're going to close in the next few weeks or so, Mama says, but since it's the end of the school year, we'll wait until you guys are out for summer to move. Because moving ain't no joke, Daddy adds. Hopefully we can get settled in before you go off to college, Seven, Mama says. Plus it gives you a chance to make your room yours, so you can have it for holidays and the summer. Sakani slurps his milkshake and says with a mouth full of froth, Seven said he's not going to college. Daddy says, what? Seven glares at Sakani. I didn't say I wasn't going to college. I said I wasn't going away to college. I'm going to Central Community so I can be around for Kenya and Lyric. Oh, hell no, Daddy says. You can't be serious, says Mama. Central Community is the junior college on the edge of Garden Heights. Some people call it Garden Heights High 2.0. Because so many people from Garden High go there and take the same drama and bullshit with them. They have engineering classes, Seven argues. But they don't have the same opportunities as those schools you applied to, Mama says. Do you realize what you're passing up? Scholarships? Internships? The chance for me to finally have a Seven free life, I add, and slurp my milkshake. Who asked you, Seven says. Your Mama. Low blow, I know, but that response comes naturally. Seven flicks a fly, fry at me. I block it and come this close to flipping him off. But Mama says, you bet not, and I lower my finger. Look, you're not responsible for your sisters, Daddy says, but I'm responsible for you, and I ain't letting you pass up opportunities so you can go- do what two grown-ass people are supposed-, supposed to do. A dollar, Daddy, Sakani points out. I love that you look out for Kenya and Lyric, Daddy tells Seven, but there's only so much you can do. You can choose whatever college you want, and you'll be successful but you choose because that's where you want to be, not because you're trying to do somebody else's job. You hear me? Yeah, Seven says. Daddy hooks his arm around Seven's neck and pulls him closer. Daddy kisses his temple. I love you, and I always got your back. After lunch, we gather in the living room, join hands, and bow our heads. Black Jesus, thank you for this blessing, Daddy says, even when we weren't so crazy about the idea of moving. Mama clears her throat. Okay, when I wasn't so crazy about the idea of moving, Daddy corrects. You work things out. Thank you for Lisa's new job. Please help her and continue to be with her when she does extra shifts at the clinic. Help Sakani with his end-of-the-year tests. And thank you, Lord, for helping Seven do something I didn't, get a high school diploma. Guide him as he chooses a college and let him know you're protecting Kenya and Lyric. Now, Lord, tomorrow is a big day for my baby girl as she goes before this grand jury. Please give her peace and courage. As much as I want to ask you to work this case out a certain way, I know you already got a plan. I ask for some mercy, God, that's all. Mercy for Garden Heights, for Khalil's family, for Star. Help all of us through this. In your precious name, wait, Mama says. I peek out with one eye. Daddy does too. Mama never, ever interrupts prayer. Uh, baby, says Daddy. I was finishing up. I have something to add. Lord, bless my mom. And thank you that she went into her retirement fund and gave us the money for the down payment. Help us turn the basement into a suite so she can stay here sometimes. No, Lord, Daddy says. Yes, Lord, Mama says. No, Lord. Yes. No. Amen. We get home in time to catch a playoffs game. Basketball season equals war in our house. I'm a LeBron fan through and through. Miami, Cleveland, it doesn't matter. I ride with him. Daddy hasn't jumped off the Lakers ship yet, but he likes LeBron. Seven's all about the Spurs. Mama's an anybody but LeBron hater, and Sakani is whoever is winning fan. It's Cleveland versus Chicago tonight. The battle lines are drawn. Me and Daddy versus Seven and Mama. Seven jumps on that anybody but LeBron bandwagon of hateration, too. I change into my LeBron jersey. Every time I don't wear it, his team loses. Seriously, I'm not even lying. I can't wash it either. Mama washed my last jersey right before finals, and Miami lost to the Spurs. I think she did it on purpose. I take my lucky spot in the den in front of the sectional. Seven comes in and steps over me, getting putting his big bare foot near my face. I smack it away. Get your crusty foot out of my face. 
We'll see who's joking later. Ready for a butt whooping? You mean am I ready to give one? Yep. Mama peeks around the doorway. Munch, you want some ice cream? I gape at her. She knows I don't eat dairy products during games. Dairy gives me gas, and gas is bad luck. She grins. How about a sundae? Sprinkles, strawberry syrup, whipped cream? I cover my ears. La 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 la. Go away, LeBron hater. La 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 la. Like I said, basketball season equals war, and my family has the dirtiest tactics. Mama returns with a big bowl, shoveling ice cream into her mouth. She sits on the sectional and lowers her bowl into my face. You sure you don't want some munch? It's your favorite too. Cake batter, so good. Be strong, I tell myself, but damn, that ice cream looks good. Strawberry syrup glistens on it and a big dollop of whipped cream sits pretty on top. I close my eyes. I want a championship more. Well, you aren't getting that, so you may as well enjoy some ice cream. Ha, seven goes. What's all this smack up in here, Daddy asks. He takes the recliner on the sectional, his lucky spot. Sakani scurries in and sits behind me, propping his bare foot, feet on my shoulders. I don't mind. They haven't matured and funkified yet. I was offering Munch some of my Sunday, Mama says. You want some, baby? Heck nah, you know I don't eat dairy during games. See, it's serious. You and Seven may as well get ready for this butt whooping Cleveland about to give y'all, says Daddy. I mean, I, it ain't gonna be... A Kobe butt whooping, but it's going to be a good one. Amen, I say, except the Kobe part. Boy, bye, Mama says. You're always picking sorry teams. First, the Lakers. A, a 3P ain't a sorry team, baby, and I don't always pick sorry teams, he grins. I picked your team, didn't I? Mama rolls her eyes, but she's grinning too, and I hate to admit it, but they're kind of cute right now. Yeah, she says, that's the only time you picked right. Uh Uh-huh, Daddy says. See, your mama played for St. Mary's basketball team, and they had a game against Garden Heights, my school. And we whooped their butts, too, Mama says, licking her ice cream off her spoon. Them little girls ain't have anything on us, I'm just saying. Anyway, I'm there to watch some of the homeboys play after the girls game, Daddy says, looking at Mama. This is so adorable. I can't stand it. I got there early and saw the finest girl ever, and she was playing her ass off on the court. Tell them what you did, says Mama, although we know. Hey, I was trying to. No, no, tell them what you did first. She says, I tried to get your attention. Uh Uh-uh, Mama says, getting up. She hands me her bowl and stands in front of the TV. You were like this on the sidelines, she says, and she kind of leans to the side, holding her crotch and licking her lips. We crack up, and I can so see Daddy doing that. During the middle of the game, she says, standing there looking like a pervert, just watching me. But you noticed me, Daddy says, right? Because you look like a fool. Then during halftime, I'm on the bench, and he's behind me talking about, she deepens her voice, Hey, hey, shorty, what's your name? You know you're looking good out there. Can I get your number? Dang, Pops, you didn't have any game, Seven says. I had game, Daddy argues. Did you get her number that night, though, Seven says. I mean, I was working on it. Did you get her number? I repeat Seven's question. Nah, he admits, and we're hollering, laughing. Man, whatever, hate all y'all want, but I eventually did something right. Yeah, Mama admits, running her fingers through my hair. You did. By the second quarter of Cleveland versus Chicago, we're yelling and shouting at the TV. When LeBron steals the ball, I jump up and bam, he dunks it. In your face, I yell at Mama and Seven. In your face. Daddy gives me a high five and claps. That's what I'm talking about. Mama and Seven roll their eyes. I sit in my game time positions, position. Knees pulled in, right arm draped over my head and holding my left ear and my left thumb in my mouth. Don't hate. It works. Cleveland... Cleveland's offense and defense is on point. Let's go Cavs. Glass shatters, then pop, 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 gunshots. Get down, Daddy yells. I'm already down. Sakani comes down next to me, then Mama on top of us, and she wraps her arms around us. Daddy's feet thud through the front of the house, and the hinges on the front door squeak as it swings open. Tires screech off. Mother f- gunshots cut Daddy off. My heart stops. For a split second, I visit a world without my dad, and it doesn't seem like much of a world at all. But his footsteps rush back in. Y'all all right? The weight on top of me lifts. Mama says she's okay, and Sakani says he is too. Seven echoes them. Daddy's holding his Glock. I shot at them fools, he says between heavy breaths. I think I hit a tire. I ain't never seen that car before. Did they shoot in the house, Mama asks? Yeah, a couple shots through the front window, he says. They threw something too, landed in the living room. I head for the front. Star, get back here, Mama calls. I'm too curious and too hard-headed. Glass shards glisten all over Mama's good sofa. A brick sits in the middle of the floor. Mama calls Uncle Carlos. He gets to our house in half an hour. Daddy hasn't stopped pacing the den, and he hasn't put his Glock down. 
Seven takes Sakani to bed. Mama has her arm around me on the sectional and won't let go. Some of our neighbors checked in, like Mrs. Pearl and Miss Jones. Mr. Charles from next, next door rushed over, holding his own piece. None of them saw who did it. It doesn't matter who did it. It was clearly a message for me. I have this sick feeling like I got when I ate ice cream and played in hot weather too long when I was younger. Miss Rosalie said the heat boiled my stomach and that something cool would settle it. Nothing cool can settle this. Did you call the police, Uncle Carlos asks. Hell nah, says Daddy. How would I, how I know it wasn't them? Maverick, you still should have called, Uncle Carlos says. This needs to be recorded and they can send somebody to guard the house. Oh, I got somebody to guard the house. Don't worry about that. It definitely ain't going to be no crooked pit pig who may have been behind this. King Lords could have done this, says Uncle Carlos. Didn't you say King made a veiled threat against Star because of her interview? I'm not going tomorrow, I say, but I have a better chance of being heard at a Drake concert. It ain't no damn coincidence that somebody is trying to get to scare us the night before she testifies to the grand jury. Daddy says, that's some shit your buddies would do. You'd be surprised at how many of us want justice in this case, says Uncle Carlos. But of course, classic maverick, every cop is automatically a bad cop. I'm not going tomorrow, I repeat. I ain't say every cop is a bad cop, but I ain't going to stand here like a fool thinking that some of them don't do dirty shit. Hell, they made me lay face down on the sidewalk, and for what? Because they could. It could have been either one of them, Mama says. Trying to figure out who did it will get us nowhere. The main thing is making sure Star Star is safe tomorrow. I said I'm not going, I shout. They finally hear me. My stomach holds a roiling boil. Yeah, it could have been King Lord's, but what if it was the cops? I look at Daddy and remember that moment weeks ago in front of the store. I thought they were going to kill you, I croak, because of me. He kneels in front of me and sits the Glock beside my feet. He lifts my chin. Point one of the ten-point program. Say it. My brothers and I learned to recite the Black Panther's ten-point program the same way other kids learned the Pledge of Allegiance. We want freedom, I say. We want the power to determine the destiny of our black and oppressed communities. Say it again. We want freedom. We want the power to determine the destiny of our black and oppressed communities. Point seven. We want an immediate end to police brutality, I say, and the murder of black people, other people of color, and oppressed people. Again, we want an immediate end to police brutality and the murder of black people, other people of color, and oppressed people. And what did Brother Malcolm say is our objective? Seven and I could recite Malcolm X quotes by the time we were 13. Sakani hasn't gotten there yet. Complete freedom, justice, and equality, I say, by any means necessary. Again, Complete freedom, justice, and equality by any means necessary. So why are you going to be quiet, Daddy asks. Because the 10-point program didn't work for the Panthers. Huey Newton died a crackhead, and the government crushed the Panthers one by one. By any means necessary, didn't keep Brother Malcolm from dying, possibly at the hands of his own people. Intentions always look better on paper than in reality. The reality is, I may not make it to the courthouse in the morning. Two loud knocks at the front door startle us. Daddy straightens up, grabs his Glock, and leaves to answer. He says what's up to somebody, and there's a sound like palms slapping. Then a male voice says, you know we got you, Big Mav. Daddy returns with tall, wide-shouldered guys dressed in gray and black. It's a lighter gray than what King and his folks wear. It takes a hood-trained eye to notice it and understand. This is a different set of King Lords. This is Goon. Daddy points at the shortest, shortest one in front of in front with the in front with the ponytails. Him and his boy is going to provide security for us tonight and tomorrow. Uncle Carlos folds his arms and gives the King Lords a hard look. You ask King Lords to guard the house when King Lords may have put us in this position? They don't mess with King, Daddy says. They cedar grove King Lords. Shit, they may as well be GDs then. Sets make all the difference in gang banging, not colors. The cedar grove King Lords have been beefing with King Set, the west side King Lords, for a while now. You need us to fall back, Big Mav? Goon asks. No, nah, don't worry about him, Daddy says. Y'all do what you came to do. Nothing but a thing, Goon says, and gives Daddy dap. Him and his boys head back outside. Are you serious right now, Uncle Carlos yells? You really think gangbangers can provide adequate security? They strapped, ain't they, Daddy says. Ridiculous. Uncle Carlos looks at Mama. Look, I'll go with you to the courthouse tomorrow as long as they ain't, aren't coming too. Punk ass, Daddy says. Can't even protect your niece because you're scared of what it'll look like to your fellow cops if you're working with gangbangers. Oh, you want to go there, Maverick? Uncle Carlos says. Carlos, calm down. 
No, Lisa, I want to make sure I got this right. Does he mean the same niece I took care of while he was locked up? Huh? The one I took to her first day of school because he took a charge for his so-called boy? The one I held when she cried for her daddy? He's loud, and Mama stands in front of him to keep him from daddy. You can call me as many names as you want, Maverick, but don't you ever say I don't care about my niece and nephews. Yeah, that's right, nephews. Seven, two. When you were locked up, Carlos, Mama says. No, he needs to hear this. When you were locked up, I helped Lisa every time your sorry-ass baby mama dropped seven off on her for weeks at a time. Me. I bought clothes, food, provided shelter. My Uncle Tom ass. Hell no, I don't want to work with criminals. But don't you ever insinuate I don't care about any of these kids. Daddy's mouth makes a line. He's silent. Uncle Carlos snatches his keys off the coffee table, gives my forehead two pecks, and leaves. The front door slams shut.